How's everybody doing? Doing good? Yeah. Doing great? Yes. Doing blessed? Everybody here? Yes. Everybody awake? Yes. yes. I know I'm awake. I just had some coffee earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so today's teaching is a um, today's title for today's message is Jesus the Wonderful, the Counselor. Before I get started, I actually want to say something. I had a, a, a was here yesterday when we were doing the close I was talking to a gentleman uh, and he uh, he had said something he heard that was pretty it was pretty cool the way he said it he was talking about getting degrees in Christianity he was uh, he had said it I looked it up and I got more or less uh, exactly the same that he was saying and it, and it goes like this it goes as a Christian I hold several degrees associates degree I associate with my brothers and sisters a BA degree, I am born again. Mm. Master's degree, I walk with my master. Mm. A PhD, I pray some daily. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, when he said it, I was like, man, you got to say it again, because that was just awesome. You know, he, he, he was well-informed, and we were just fellowshipping back and forth about the Word of God. You know, it was just an amazing experience. And when he told me that, I was like, hmm, that's a pretty yeah. good view of how we should see uh, our growth, right? We should reach for those degrees shoot for those degrees and, and, and accomplish them we're born again we have we have our master and praising him daily we actually talked about that about praying every day throughout the day so this title that i that i got I actually got from isaiah and in the king james version it actually separates the wonderful and the counselor in some translations like in the niv it has both one it has put them together the wonderful counselor and whichever way you translate it, it's still, I mean, it's not much of a change. It still means the same. Wonderful counselor or just wonderful. Jesus is wonderful. And counselor, he's a very good counselor. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today is about how Jesus is, has everything that we need. And he has, he's so amazing. He goes beyond expectation. And so we worship a wonderful counselor. Jesus is a wonderful counselor. But the word that we use for wonderful nowadays is something more along the lines of pleasant, right? We, it's been used and it's been kind of watered down to be something just pleasant. But in the Bible, it actually talks, is the word that's used is, is, is pala. And the root word for that is miracle. It comes from the word miracle or miraculous. And what it indicates is something beyond human expectation, beyond human expectation. And here's a definition that I found that best explains uh, that word, right? Wonderful. It says uh, the definition of wonderful adjective, extraordinarily good or great, used especially as intensifiers. And here's some, here are some synonyms. Fantastic, grand, howling, incredible, marvelous, rattling, terrific, tremendous, wondrous, extraordinary, beyond what is ordinary or usual, highly unusual or exceptional or remarkable. So if Jesus is our wonderful counselor, then Jesus goes beyond any ordinary counselor, any human counselor, anybody here on this earth, he goes beyond that. He is beyond any ordinary therapist. He is beyond any ordinary psychologist. The word of God says that we must worship in spirit and in truth. And the truth is we have all we need in Christ and is revealed through the Bible. Christ alone is wonderful. His life is beyond expectation. He was born from, he was born of a virgin. That's wonderful, right? That is amazing to be born of a virgin. And that's, if you want to read into that, Matthew first, Matthew 1, 20, verse 23. He healed people right on the spot. That's miraculous. That's Wonderful. That's amazing. That's beyond expectation. I mean, I, 
don't know anybody that could heal right on the spot like Jesus did. And he didn't even have to be in the same room to heal. He healed the blind, the lame, and the leopard instantly, as soon as he said it. And this is what the scripture says about that. On Matthew 8, verse 5 through 13. It says when Jesus, and this is talking this is about a centurion, right? He had a servant that was dying. So he, he goes, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, the centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. We have to understand one thing. At this time, during this time, the Gentiles and Jews, Jews didn't associate with Gentiles. They did not, they, 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 they would consider themselves defiled if they were to ever go into a Gentile's home. So you can kind of see where the centurion had that mindset. I am not worthy for you to be in my home. He had that mindset thinking, you're too good to be in my home. I'm nothing. I'm worthless. That's important to, to know because Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that that mindset was different, but he didn't address that first. What he addressed was this. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Jesus addresses his faith and, and, and how amazing it was. He addressed it for, for a reason, right? He addressed it because he, this man knew that Jesus could heal his servant without even being there. He had faith in that power and that authority to be able to do that because he understood that he was a centurion, right? He, he knew what, what authority was and he knew by seeing him that he had authority and what he had to, what, when he would say something. Verse 11, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking. I say to you, that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now he's addressing some, now he's, he's addressing his mindset by telling him, no matter who you are, where you come from, if you're a child of God, you will sit and eat with us in the kingdom of heaven. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be a, a, a priest, be in the priesthood. He says, anybody will come from the east and the west and will take their place and, and have a feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So he's addressing his mindset because, like I said, he knew that the centurion thought he was less yeah. than worthy. And so in verse 12, which is, 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 is as impactful. You read verse 12, it says, but the subjects, in, in the King James Version, it says, the sons of the kingdom. He's talking about the Jews. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the very people, which we know, that are the Pharisees who rejected Jesus Christ as God, those were the chosen people. And he's addressing, he's letting them know that even they will be put out from the kingdom of heaven. And so it doesn't matter whether you're Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter what background you have. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You will be in heaven. And God knows, Jesus knows us very well. God knows us very well. He knows us to the core. He knows our mentality. He knows our, our behavior. He knows what we're thinking, how we're feeling. He knows everything about us. He is inside us. Now, verse 13 says, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. He is an amazing teacher. And he lived a perfect life. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know who is more credible to be my counselor than Jesus Christ. 
one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. This just keeps getting better. <laughs> I don't know anybody who has not sinned. Right? Even, us as, even us being up here teaching, we can only teach based on the life that Jesus set. I cannot give you examples of what I've done. I can give you my experiences where I messed up and fallen short from the glory of God. But ultimately, Jesus Christ is who teaches me, and that's where I teach others about Christ. And I point to him because I'm not credible. I have sinned. I have fallen short. I have messed up and I've made mistakes. But Jesus has more credibility to be our wonderful counselor. He died and rose again three days. Three days later, came back, right? He died. Three days later, he rose again. That's, man, I think there's a, a, a YouTuber that I watch, and he says, if someone dies and comes back three days later, I'm going to listen to that guy. <laughs> okay. I'm going to listen to what he has to say. And so Jesus Christ has all the credibility we need to be able to trust in him. There's nobody on earth that could beat that. Jesus is the only one qualified to counsel us. He is even more qualified than the so-called professionals in this world that study diligently just to only scratch the surface of our problems. And as humans, we're, we're used to that, right? We're used to the world telling us how we feel or how we should feel. We're used to the world telling us how we should act. We're used to, to, we're used to the world telling us what to change, how to be, some of us, right? And instead of seeking God for his wonderful counsel, the world's solutions, the world's solution are only temporary. They leave us wanting more. Whereas Jesus gives us this unexplainable peace that we won't find anywhere and it's everlasting. I'm going to give you a few definitions. I'm going to time this right. Okay. So the psychology. The word psychology um, is the scientific study of, human, of the human mind and its functions, especially those affecting behavior in a given context. Therapy. Treatment intended to relieve or heal a, dis a disorder. Counseling, the provision of assistance and guidance in resolving personal, social, or psychological problems and difficulties, especially by a professional. That's the world's definition and pretty accurate. And let me give you some more information. The word therapy is used in the Bible often. It's, uh, the word is used as uh, thera therapeo. And you, when you ever, whenever you read uh, Jesus healing people, healing people in, in the book of Matthew, Mark, whenever you hear Jesus healing, that word is being used. And there's, there's a different version of the way therapy was used, you know, healed or healed or cured. And so that's being used when Jesus heals someone. And so the, the, the word means to restore, right? Restore, heal, or cure. So this is the interesting part that I read. The word psychology is studying of the human mind. That's what, that's what the definition of the world is. So the word psych, in the beginning of that word, the root word is actually psyche, which means soul. And ology means sci the scientific study of the human soul. But it's, it's, it's funny how the, the world makes it, makes it into the mind. The Bible separates the both mind and soul as two different areas of the human person. So it, it's the study of the human soul, and then there's our human mind. So the way I see it is that professionals here in this world, they, they can only do so much because they see it as just a problem of the mind. That is just a problem of the mind, and that's the thing that convinces us that that's one and the same. It's two different things. And this is what Luke, Luke chapter 10, verse 27 says. And this is the commandment, right? This is a commandment. 
This is the, the uh, teacher of the law asking Jesus Christ, what can I do to, to receive eternal life? And the Bible doesn't say eternal life as in salvation. It's talking about eternal life. How can I have a good life here in a sense, right? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So these are the things that we need to do. Love the Lord with all your heart, right? It's a different area. With all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. So th those things have been separated for a reason. And God knows, God knows why. Why our soul and mind are two separate things, There's different areas that we got that we that we have to work on. Jesus counsels each and every one of those areas: the soul, the mind, the heart, and strength in our body. Our body is also part of that. This is what Paul says about our mindset and spirit. Uh, Romans eight five through nine says, "Those who live according to the flesh." have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, how, however, that's us, are not in the realm of the flesh but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. I like how the commentary explains this part. It says, we must, however, guard against a false spirituality and see that Paul means the flesh insofar as it is an instrument in our rebellion against God. Paul is not talking about normal physical and emotional needs we may think about, only the sinful gratification of those needs. So it's not talking about that this body, physical body, is wrong. God created us perfect. He created Adam and Eve perfect. It's when sin corrupted and came in as to why we start to using these desires, these passions that God put in us, to do sinful things, to do things against God's order, to do things against God's way. And that is the, 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 the definition of the difference is what Paul is trying to say, right? He's not talking about your flesh, physical body, right? It's talking about your, your desire to do with the body. That's going to be against God. Because we all have needs that are built into these bodies, right? We have I need to get hungry. We get hungry. I don't know. I eat a lot. <laughs> we get hungry. We have desire to love one another. Right? We have a desire to, for companionship. Right? We have a desire to, 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 you know, to interact with people. Right? We have a desire. We have certain passions, certain, certain natural desires that we have when it comes to being married, husband and wife. And we we understand these to be natural. These are things that God placed in our bodies to do. It's when we start using these things to abuse the law of God. And so Jesus counsels us through his spirit in us to use our bodies according to the spirit to honor God. Jesus counsels us through his spirit in us to have a change of heart. Right? We, can all, we have all experienced some kind of emotional anger, sadness, things that are not of God, depression, anxiety. These are all things that, that we, have, uh, uh, an, we have to have an understanding that Jesus Christ has everything that we need to be able to overcome these things that come in this world because it's fallen. So when we desire to no longer be angry is because the spirit of God in us that teaches us and tells us not to, it counsels us, it counsels us to do better beyond the expectation of what the world says, beyond the expectation of what therapy therapists say. Now, 
Don't get me wrong. I went to a therapist. She gave me a good few insights to be able to understand some of the things that I was dealing with. But studying the scriptures and praying to God, I achieved more than that. Because God in me, Jesus in me, has revealed a lot more than what the therapist did. And so when you finally understand the difference between people of the world and God, you start to live that out. And there's a change that happens. And this is why he's a wonderful counselor, right? Because he gives us good advice. He gives us great advice. He gives us advice that goes beyond anybody. People, people in the world would be confused. Like, it's not right according to the world. Jesus counsels us through his spirit in us to not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that is one of the obstacles that I had coming to Christ. But I still do the same thing. I still sin. Why? I, still, you know, I, I keep picking up all the things that I keep not wanting to do. Why do I keep doing that? I remember the conversations I would have with pastor and he, he would make it clear to me saying that the very fact, the very thought that you have that rejects that, or that you start to feel bad about it, saying, you know what, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. That is the spirit of God counseling me to tell me that is not correct. That is not according to God. That is not according to the spirit. This is the order of God. The Holy Spirit enters when we are born again. It enters. As soon as we're born again, we have the Holy Spirit. As soon as you realize who Jesus Christ is in your life, the Holy Spirit enters you. And he counsels our soul, right? He counsels those things that are so. So our soul, if you read into the Thessalonians and you read into the commentary, it explains the difference between the spirit and the soul. And our soul is, is made, of, made up of our passions and desires as human beings. And so when, our, when the spirit of God enters, he will correct those desires to be according to Christ, according to God and how God intended those desires to be used. Then he works on our minds. He starts to work in our minds to tell us how to think how to realize that our thinking is incorrect, how to realize that our thinking is not God's way. And then our hearts, it starts chipping away that hardness of our heart and starts softening it up to be open. And finally, we start to live it out with our bodies. We start to act correctly. We start to do things with our bodies that we would like normally not do. And we'd say, Man, I, what's going on with me? <laughs> this is not me. No, it is. You know why? Because the world has made a, made a way to make you believe that how you feel and how you think is who you are. And so when we start to actually believe that the things that God changes in us, we start to think that's not me. That is not who I am. That is not. No, it is. Because that is how you were created. In the image of God. Jesus is our wonderful counselor. Amen. And he has everything we need. I'm going to read Job uh, chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of us know who Job is. Job is, is, uh, is it's a book in the Bible. It talks about the story of Job who when he got tested. Right. Satan came to God with all the angels and try to make Job be the person that God didn't like. Right. Job, he would rebuke you if this would be taken away from him. And so God allowed the testing. And so towards towards the, the middle, Job is trying to tell his friends that he knows who God is. And he says, verse 13, to God belong wisdom and power. Counsel and understanding are his. Job knew that he, that God had tremendous wisdom. 
He had power, wonderful counsel, and understanding. This is what Psalm says, Psalm 73, 24. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. The commentary on that one is, is where the difference between how God counsels you and how the world counsels you. So significantly, Asaph was a writer who was talked about in Psalms, expected God to guide him with his counsel. He expected to hear God's wisdom and receive guidance through it. He didn't expect to be guided primarily through feelings, circumstances, or experiences, but to be guided through counsel. So feelings are not part of that counsel. He, God, doesn't, God doesn't want you to just feel things. Yeah, we experience some kind of emotion and feelings. We love God and we have a love for God. But feelings are not the basis of it, right? Because sometimes we're kind of, we're not feeling so good. We don't want to worship God when things are going, well, well actually, when things are going well, we, try, we forget to worship God. And when things are going bad, that's when we remember. It's like, God, why things are messing up? Well, because you stepped out of place. And so when we understand that the counsel of God isn't based on feelings, that's, that's wonderful. And it's wonderful even more because God is not going to go. He's not a human like us where he'll change his mind about how he feels about us. He loves us to the point where he gives up his life for us. And we were not even, we were, we were against him at that time. We were in sin at that moment. We were not following through. And there's times in our, even in our spiritual walk nowadays where we make a mistake and mess up and, Sometimes we feel guilty or ashamed, and that's the enemy trying to make you feel like God is against you. But God is there guiding you, counseling you. Those moments where you say, this is, this is wrong. This is not okay. I'm going to let you uh, in on a little. <laughs> let me let you into my kitchen a little bit. So. I'm a human being. I'm still working on some of the things I, I've married, and that's been a challenge for me in our communication. So I'm going to let you in a little bit on where I messed up. So <laughs> me and my wife were arguing a couple of days ago. And uh, <laughs> in my frustration, and I guess you could say in my flesh, I was frustrated and she had told me, she had gotten the sticker for the car and we were in an argument. And towards the end of the argument, she was, she said, put the sticker on the car. And I turned around and I said, yes, your majesty. Oh. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, in my flesh, in my frustration, I responded that way, and that wasn't correct. But this is the beauty about who Jesus Christ is. Because, yes, I made a mistake. I am still a human being. I'm working at it. And this is where the counsel comes in. Because the next day, I went to my wife, and I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I told her, I'm sorry, that I yelled and said that. And in her response, she said, now you got to call me that from now on. <laughs> uh, so this is the, the thing. God counseled me at that moment to apologize, to realize that how I reacted, no matter how she behaved or how she acted, it's how I reacted. He counseled me to say, apologize. He told me in my heart and in my mind to say, God, I apologize. You know you did wrong. You know you did not according to God or according to the spirit. It was according to the flesh. And that was true. That was right. And that was correct. And so I apologize. And now I got to live with calling my wife, your majesty. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so Jesus counseled my heart and uh, made, made me realize some things. And so, man, just... 
Don't do that. <laughs> Learn from my mistakes. <laughs> uh, so Psalm 16, 7 says, uh, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. That's uh, David talking about how God counsels him. And it starts changing your heart. You really start to open up and soften to, to be more like God, to love like he does, to, to be patient like he is, to, to be merciful and to, be, to have grace. That is what God teaches us to be. He counsels our heart. He counsels our mind. He counsels our soul. He, and we start to do these things. And so it takes a process. It takes some time. And the funny thing about time and choices, I had a good conversation with the brother and, and, and we talked about making a choice. God counsels us, counsels us every day, especially when we're in sin, when we're doing things incorrectly, he counsels us. And one of the things that the world says about is in time, in time, you will do better or in time, just give it time and you'll get over it or in time, you know, time will heal. But when it comes to God, God knows the time when things will change. God knows the time when you are going to make that decision. For us, it's when we make the choice. You have to make the choice and say, God is my rock. Whatever circumstances you're going through, you have, you, we understand that God is everything that we need. He has everything that we need, no matter what you're going through. And that requires you making that choice to choose God before your problems, to choose God before your finances, to choose God before your relationship problems, to choose God in the midst of temptation, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of everything. So I hope whenever you hear that this verse, or you hear someone talk about needing a counselor or a therapist, that you give them this verse and tell them all we need is Jesus. Mm. And that's, this is Isaiah, Isaiah 9, chapter 6. It says, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Like, there's nothing wrong with, with reaching out to brothers and sisters to get counseling. Counseling in and itself is someone who has had experience in that particular area that you're going through and help you get through it. This is why God causes us to fellowship. I received counsel from pastor many times, too, a lot of times, actually. <laughs> a lot, a lot of times, actually. And he got counsel, too. We all get counseled, and the source of that counseling comes from Jesus Christ. He is the wonderful counselor that we could go to. And so he puts us all together for that reason, to be able to counsel each other, help each other, support each other, not go out into the world and be told things that are against who God is, or to be, be uh, uh, put in a position that, you know, we think that we identify with our feelings and, and our thinking when God says otherwise. God says otherwise. He is not, is not one of the main things that <laughs> actually, um, we, watched, we watched The Little Mermaid the other day. I remember The Little Mermaid. I've seen it when we were younger. Well, when you, first of all, when you become an adult and have kids, it, it, it becomes a whole different thing. Like, right. hmm. And when you become an adult with kids and then you're a Christian, that's even more. Yeah. And there's two situations where it's funny because uh, I think uh, the little Murphy is, she's like supposed to be 16, right? And uh, she, it's, it's put in a way where it says you could go against what your father says. And it makes the father look like he's, controlling her right so that's one i'm like that's not how we're just trying to protect our daughters right then the other part is i'm not trying to ruin disney movies for you guys but the other part is uh is the the octopus the, the witch lady who 
does the spell for them and she's trying to convince her of it. She entertains the desire to want to do things that she feels, that she thinks that that's right, that this feels better or this is. And that is how we get kind of into that. Like we don't see the show as just entertainment and we just watch it. it we, some of us actually start to believe that that's how we should live up. And one of the things that the octopus lady, witch thing, whatever it says, it was saying that people desire some certain things that she'll give it to them for a price. And to me, that was like, sometimes that's what the devil does. Yeah. He will put things into our mind and say, how you feel and how you think is who you are. God says, no, that is just what's going on. Come to me and I will show you the truth through my spirit. And so I hope that whoever has ears, let them hear. Because as I was studying this and I'm like, man, God, there's so many things that, that I don't know yet. And I want to know. I want to know more about you. I want to do more. And so it, it's, it's amazing how God has able to help me in my life um, dealing with anxiety. And like I mentioned before, uh, in our, in our call, sometimes I deal with anxiety every now and then, but I tell myself this, that is just a reaction of the body. And I tell myself, God is still great. And God is the only one that I need. Thank you, everybody.